Okay, so does anybody have any questions about uh, the previous assignment before we move on? See, that's the other thing. When you come to questions with me at the last minute, it takes me a couple extra seconds to do this. So um, execution time. So in, in example 1.3 here, let me see if I can zoom in a little more. So last time we talked about uh, CPI, right? What does CPI stand for? Cycles per instruction, right? right. So that, it's okay. That's why I'm asking. We were making mistakes now instead of uh, exam, just like the asking the questions now so of doing something that gets it fired, right? So it's cycles per instruction. So the example is asking here, suppose we have two implementations of the same instruction, et cetera. Oh, I should say, uh, I apologize, uh, particularly to you two. I was uh, not. Could, I could have been to handle that a little better. You know, that's great. So, suppose we have two implementations of the same instruction set architecture. Computer A has a clock cycle time of 250 picoseconds. What is a pico? Twelve. Twelve. Good. Very good. Ten. Yep. Ten. Eight, ten. And a CPI of 2.0 for some program. Computer B has a clock cycle time of 500 picoseconds and a CPI of 1.2 for the same program. Which computer is faster and by how much? So this is where knowing ratios, knowing the equations can really help you out. I set up the, uh, my solution here for in a specific way for a specific reason. So we want to find out which computer is faster. So if I'm asking which computer is faster, what metric am I looking for? Some sort of ratio of performance, exactly right. So that's, and you can see down here, that's where this, I have the solution. Man, I wish the screen was bigger. Um, oh, well, I'll just live with it. You guys get a video anyway. Um, so we start out, we know we have clock cycle time, right? And we have CPI. So we don't need to say we're at a situation, you're on the exam. Oh my goodness, I have no idea how to set this up. So I know I've got clock cycles and I have CPI. So how do I set this up? So if I have cycles over cycles and some program here, that means that if we, I have the same program, it's going to be the same number of instructions, correct? So I have clock cycles, I have CPI, and I have the number of instructions. So if I have uh, I'm sorry, cycle time, sorry. So uh, seconds per cycle times cycles per instruction. And you got to remember stoichiometry from uh, uh, high school chemistry? Same thing, you want to cancel them to cancel out. So this is how the, the units will set you free in this situation. So now I have number of instructions for some program. So then I can multiply that by instructions. It goes away. And now I have my time, which is what you were all saying over there, some ratio of, of time. So then that is just the way of setting up that equation. Remember that from the top of guide objective, that became CPI times instructions times cycle time. Remember that? So we just derived that equation. So we then set them up in a ratio, to determine which one is faster. Uh, we don't know which one is going to be faster at first, so we just do A over B. Do you have, Emily, do you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. So then we use our equation, uh, 2 times I times 250 picoseconds. I's will cancel out, so this becomes 2 times 250 divided by 1.2 times 500, and that comes out to 0 0.83. So what is it, if it's 0 0.83, what does that mean? What are we, correct, so which computer is faster, so it's exactly, I don't know, yeah. so it's going to be B, that means if it's less than 1, B is faster, if it's greater than 1, A is faster. So. 
That means since n is less than 1, therefore the execution time of a is less than the execution time of b. Uh, therefore, this is that comes out to uh, 500 seconds. So a is less than b, and the execution time of a is less than the execution time of b. Which one is faster? A, right? By a factor of, save screenshot, I do not want to do that. <coughs> Does that make sense? I, I, I put it specifically in this way because this is the most confusing. I know it sounds like a trick. But what I want you to do is, if, if, if you encounter this situation on the exam, I want you to know how to handle it. So you set them up, you get less than one. That means execution A is less than execution B, which means that A is the faster program. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about that? And our, our performance questions are starting to get a little more complicated. Okay, so as we start throwing more programs in, so before I say that, every computer doesn't just run one program, right? Computers run different programs. They have required different resources. Have you ever... You have multiple apps on your phone. One runs really fast, one runs really slow, requires a lot of memory. Or if, let's say, uh, you don't code it properly and you request a lot of load stores instead of accessing your local fast registers. So sometimes coding can really improve how fast your hardware is. And if you're accessing more memory, it takes more power, it can be uh, problematic. So what you want to do is you want to figure out how a specific program is affecting your overall computing performance. And we're going to learn about something later today called Amdahl's Law, which is basically if you improve one aspect of the computer, it doesn't improve that whole computer by that same ratio. If you have five stages and you improve one stage by half, that doesn't mean the whole computer is improved by half, just that one stage. So the average cycles per instruction here is a unit that may be used when you have different performance metrics for different instruction types or different programs. And the average CPI is the summation. So TGO 1.14 is this equation here. It's the summation of CPI times the instruction count. So if I have, and we'll go over this in example 1.4, so it's that CPI times that instruction count plus the next CPI times the instruction count plus the next CPI times the instruction count. And that's all divided by the total number of instructions, which is just the summation of each instruction count. And so in 1.4 here, without even scrolling down, we can actually use this equation to solve it. So given the following CPI for three instruction classes, and the number of instruction counts for each instruction class on two separate computers. Determine which of the two computers is faster and the average CPI for each. So in this case, I have three programs, A, B, and C. And I have two computers, computer one and computer two. And so I have the instruction counts, and so obviously most programs have thousands if not millions of instructions, not one or two, but this proves the point is a good case. Um, what do we want to do? We want to determine the average CPI for each and then use that average CPI to determine a performance ratio, right? So by using this equation, we can do for computer one, it's 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3 divided by the summation of the instruction counts, which is 2 plus 1 plus 2. So that becomes 2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10 over 5, right? So that becomes 2. So 
Same thing for computer two. So CPI of or average CPI is two here. So same thing for uh, computer two. What what's the how are we going to solve this? So, uh, somebody I want to volunteer. I hear somebody mumbling the right answer in the back there. Yes. Correct. Correct. Absolutely right. So that becomes four plus two is six plus three is nine over six. <coughs> so that's three halves. So the average cycles per instruction for that is two. And then the other one's going to be three halves. So which computer has a the lower average cycles per instruction? Two. Computer two, right? So what that means computer two is going to have the better performance. And so here, what we have just done is all is all written out properly. Um, I just had the I divided this up. You don't have when you're doing the homework assignment tonight. Uh, what you will notice, and you probably noticed this before, is I put more steps into the problem than is required to solve it. The reason I'm doing that is because I feel that often, particular, I don't know which one of you, the bad physics professor that you were talking about yesterday, uh, my pet peeve, particularly in physics, chemistry, computer engineering, engineering, is that we kind of assume that you know things and throw in about 10 or 11 steps. And you're like, wait a minute, how did you do that? And then you go, of course you should know how to do that. And then you fail the exam and you're mad. So sometimes I'll add in extra steps here that you don't need to include. Th writing this part out, you know, uh, putting the 10 over 5 here, or adding these out and adding these out here is sufficient. And then you just make it some sort of statement that uh, 1.5 is less than you know, uh, 2 over 1.5 using our performance equation. Is uh, four, you know, four thirds. So that's the improvement in performance. And so what we just came up with in this problem is something known as speed up. So speed up is the factor by which the execution time has been decreased. Execution time old over execution time new, or performance new over performance old. As you recall from last lecture, uh, that the performance is the inverse of the execution time, right? So it just makes sense that you have one is flipped over the other. So should mention 1.16. You will see that again in the future. This is a very important concept in computer science and computer engineering. Now, when I describe it and its importance, you're probably going to think, well, that's kind of common sense. But you'd be surprised how many people lose sight of this while designing a system. So Amidal's law is finding the new execution time is equal to the affected portion that you just improved in the performance divided by the speed up plus the unaffected time. So if you have 100, if your program took 100 nanoseconds to, ex to execute, and your ALU took 20 nanoseconds of that time, and I improve the speed up by a factor <coughs> of 2, so that becomes 20 divided by 2, which is equal to 10. So then it becomes 10 plus the unaffected, so it's 20 nanoseconds that's done by the ALU, that means there's 80 that have not, correct? So that becomes 10 plus 80, which is equal to 90. So that's 1.16. It helps in finding the maximum expected improvement to the overall system performance when only part of the system is improved. So you saw in that little equation I just 
came up with there, it improved it by 10 nanoseconds, right? It did not improve it by 50 nanoseconds, right? I did not improve the whole system by half. People lose sight of that, especially when you're like working on a deadline. And, you know, I know you've all worked on coding projects now, right? You ever do something, you tr come troubleshoot this error, it takes you hours and hours, and you figure out that just one stupid variable was put in the wrong place, and you're like, ah. You know, people make silly mistakes. So, for example, your professor putting the same problem as 1.1 and 1.2 on the TGS, right? So, we all make silly mistakes. So we want to reinforce better engineering principles. Amidal's law states that you want to focus on improving certain parts. Make the common case fast, right? So you want to try to, the part that you think is going to consume the most, you want to try to reduce the uh, uh, throughput of that particular section. All right, so here's an example of how Almendal's law can be applied here. So 1.5, given a program's execution time, did I just come, oh no, I, just, <laughs> I was like, I almost did the exact problem off the top of my head. I've been teaching this class too long. Um, given a program's execution time of 100 nanoseconds, the floating point addition, which takes up 20 nanoseconds of the program's execution time, is sped up by a factor of five. What is the program's new execution time? So we use this Amidal's law, kind of stepping through it the same way that I did before. We have 20 nanoseconds, and it's proof, the speed up is by a factor of five. That means it's been improved. Like, so if it's 20 improved by a factor of five, which is 20 divided by five, that's now four, correct? So when I say it's sped up by a factor of five, that's what I mean, as opposed to you know, uh, if I spend it up by five nanoseconds, that would be going from 20 to 15. So if I went from 20 to 15, what would be the speed up? Correct. Four thirds, 25% both. So you're improving a five factor of 25%, or you're speeding up by four thirds. So in this case, you have your speed up is five. So the reason why you use four thirds here in that other case is because four thirds would then give you 15. Does that make sense? So then the unaffected is just, you have 20 nanoseconds is your affected time, right? So then your unaffected becomes the original minus the affected time. The part that has not been adjusted at all is the exact same as you were before. That's why it's transparent. What's the term that you shouldn't use on an exam? For computer, do not use invisible. Making me happy. Um, so that becomes 80. So you've reduced the 20 nanoseconds to four. You've kept the 80 nanoseconds the same, and it becomes 84 nanoseconds. Does that make sense? So the next problem is a little more of a complex version. You're combining CPU time, cycle time, uh, and Amidal's law. So the table below shows the instruction type breakdown for different programs. So we have compute, uh, load, store, branch, and total. So that's your total number of instructions, right? So assuming that computes take one cycle, load stores take two cycles, and branches take three cycles, or load and stores take two, Find the execution time for each program on a 3 gigahertz MIPS processor. So how do we go about doing that? Let me scroll down and hide the answer. So you're, you're on an exam. You see this. I've asked you, you've got computes take one cycle, load stores take uh, two, branches take three. And uh, I want you to find the execution time. How do I set that up? Let me go over to the whiteboard. So you all are now showing me. Someone tell me how you address this problem. Here's what I here, uh, here's the thing I would do on exams. I would break it. I always break it down into given and what I'm trying to find. So what am I giving here? 
instructions and cycles, right? Instructions and cycles, right? So I have all of, I have this table here where I have the number of instructions and the number of cycles. So for compute, I have one cycle and 1,000 instructions, right? For load, two. It's in load, two cycles, and then 40, 400, was it 400? Uh, a store is load instructions will take two cycles. Uh, so I got two and 100. And for branch, I have three and 50, right? And I'm also giving, you know, clock rate. of 3 gigahertz, which is 3 times 10 to the 9 cycles per second. So what am I trying to find based on part A? What is my find? Execution time. Right? And what is execution time? Second. So, what is this starting to look like? What am I, how would I want to combine these together? Okay, so I got so I have cycles, I have instructions, and I have times. So if I'm setting this up, I want seconds equals times. Both right. So in this case, now I got to figure out my, where my cycles per instruction are coming from. My total number of instructions and seconds per cycle. Well, that's given here. So the next thing I need to do is figure this part out, right? So I have cycle per instruction, cycle per instruction, cycle per instruction, cycle per instruction, and then. I'll just multiply that out with our total number of instructions, right? So what is this? So that's average CPI. So going down here and looking how we have this typed out, that's exactly what we have done. So you guys, without even knowing anything, you derive the right answer. So then you just do, you can see how it's set up here. 1 times 1,000 plus 2 times 400 plus 2, uh, 2 times 100 plus 3 times 50. So that's your number of cycles per instruction. And then you have cycles per second, 3 gigahertz. Right? Okay. So now we have our CPU time, which is 2.15 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. So now, part B, assuming that computes take one cycle loads and take 10 cycles. Oh, that, I'm sorry, that should be two. Professor made a silly mistake. And branches take three cycles. What is the speed up of a program if the number of compute instructions can be reduced by half? So again, this is another situation where I have everything written out in a lot more detail than you actually needed to. But if I'm com now, this is where MDAL's law becomes important. What I actually do is when you're adding this up, what you can do is just say, all right, 1,000 divided by 2 becomes 500. So then you just, add, if you have these summed up, you just subtract 500, divide it by the same 3 gigahertz, and then you get 1.650 times 10 to the negative 6, right? And then you just do your speed up, because here's asking, you do your given and find again, what is the speed up of a program? So, Speed up is 2.15, they're both 10 to the negative 6, so just 2.150 divided by 1.650, right?
Right, so does anybody have any questions? Yes. Amdahl's law. That's that's the whole point of Amdahl's law. So the question is, why did we only divide the one thousand by two, right? So the the question is stated: Assuming that computes take one cycle, load stores take two, branches take three. What is the speed up of the program if the number of compute instructions can be reduced by one half? So when we go back to our problem statement, we see that this is this table has the number of instructions, right? Okay, you got it. Okay, so divide by divide one thousand by two. Everything else we leave alone. So you will on your first exam you'll see a problem similar similar to this where there's some sort of testing of your understanding of Amdahl's law. Yes. Did you say that that 10 cycles is a mistake? Yes. It should be two. I'll fix it on I'll fix it on the uh, blackboard. Any other questions? Right on. All right. So here's a more complicated looking. Amdahl's law problem. So here we have a set of a number of instructions. I could have done this table a little better, but uh, we have the following table shows the number of instruction types and their CPIs. So I have 20 point instructions. These are all times 10 to the 6. So you're going to see real quick that there's some shortcuts you could take. Just multiply everything by times, times, times 10 to the 6 at the end. Um, 20 point instructions, integer instruction, LS is load store. Branching, and then the CPIs are one for floating point, one for integer, four for, four for load store, and two for branch. So in part A, by how much must we improve the CPI of floating point instructions if we want the program to run two times faster? So let's break down that this whole glob of, of English here. By how much must we improve the CPI? of floating point instruction if we want the program to run two times faster. So what is that question? If from the perspective of, of a uh, professor, what am I asking there? What concept am I asking about? Amdahl's law, right? I'm asking an Amdahl's law question. So basically, I'm asking you to this, try to improve the floating point instructions in a way that reduces the whole program by half. Which means you're going to have to reduce the floating point instructions by a lot more than half, right? Because you're only affecting that one section. So here, first thing we do, we calculate out the total number of cycles. We have cycles per so we have instructions and CPI. So we have floating point instructions times CPI, so that's instructions divided. So we get out the total number of cycles. So it becomes 560 times 1. So I'll show you how 560 times 1 plus 2,000 times 1, plus 1,280 times 4, plus 256 <laughs> times 2. And that comes out to 8192 times 10 to the 6 cycles, right? So in order to reduce the whole program by a factor of 2, how many cycles does it need to be? Half of so that's four thousand, uh, yeah, four thousand, uh, whatever ninety six is. Yeah. Um, so how many cycles though do we? And the question is asking how much can we improve the floating point instruction? So if it's eight one nine two divided by two, that's going to be four thousand uh, ninety six. Four thousand ninety six. Because I'll carry the one. So I need to reduce a total of 4,096 cycles out of this in order to reduce it. How many total cycles do I have for a, a floating point? 560. How many do I need to reduce it by? 4,000. So is that even possible? No. So that's 
Since we only have 560, then it's not possible. So this is where Amidal's law becomes important. So let's say I am uh, manager Shubakatelli, right? And I'm going, hey, I want to, I want to, uh, I really want this computer, I really want this computer to run faster. Uh, but I only once you to reduce these floating point instructions. They actually come back and go, okay, uh, yeah, it's not, that's not that's possible. Yeah, we need to fix something else. What do you think would be the best, if you're looking at this and you're trying to do it, uh, what do you think you would be aiming for? What, what would you be trying to reduce? <coughs> load stores, exactly right. Like, i got to figure out how to improve load stores. That's my best shot, right? So in a framing of the question that's not coincidental, part B, how much would we re reduce the CPI of load store instructions if we want the program to run two times faster? So here, you've done pretty much... 90% of the math already, right? So we know it's 496. So we just figure out what's this uh, 1,280 times 4? That becomes 5,120. And yep. So we have to figure out how much of that 5,120 needs to be reduced. There's two ways of solving this problem. You can either go 5120 minus. 4096, solve it that way. So that becomes the number of cycles, and then your speed up is just uh, 5120 over 5120 minus 4096. So that's one way of solving that problem. And this that, that equation there is just the more complicated way of doing it. So if you want to do it on your homework, the way I mentioned it just there, that's the better way of doing it. But that gives you the same thing of 0.8 is your speed up, or 1 over 0.8 is your speed up. Or the, the way I have it phrased here, it must be reduced. So basically, you got to get rid of 80% of your cycles to pull that off. So then part C here, by how much is the instruction execution time? So now... Because I actually saw a couple of people go, wow, I got 80%. That's quite a challenge. So you might go back to, to manager Schmuck and tell him, go, okay, we can do that, but it's really hard to reduce load stores by 80%. Yeah. In fact, if we could do that, we would have already done it. We wouldn't have this computer, right? So you had to come up with some sort of compromise. We're going to try to improve a couple portions of this and see what we can do. So part C, by how much is the execution time of the program improved? If the CPI of integer and floating point instructions is reduced by 40%, and the CPI of load store and branch is reduced by 30%. So now you're just taking this equation that we did here. If we reduce the CPI of integer and floating points by 40%, and the CPI of load stores and branch by 30%. So again, you've done most of the math up here already. Right, you have this, so what you can do is really easy. You just take this and go, because this is CPI, and that's the CPI there, right? So you just do 0 0.4 plus, and then you can just do, uh, let's see, did I do, okay. 0 0.4, and here you can just do 0 0.3, right? So you're multiplying it all out, and then just put it in your calculator. And here I've worked it out. 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and that reduces it down to 2,713.6 cycles, 10 to the 6 cycles. And then to find the speed up, you just do that. So now I've reduced it by a factor of 3. So then what you can do is you can go back to your manager and go, we figured out we've reduced the cycle time of load stores by 40%, by 30%, we reduced floating point. By 40%, it's a much easier engineering challenge. And by the way, instead of a speed up of 2, I've got it by a speed up of 3. And they go, oh, that's even better. And then they give you a lot more money, right? Or maybe they don't. I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're assuming this is a theoretical world. Like, oh, you've done the right thing. Here's more money. It's... Before I move on, I, I know that this is a pretty complicated problem. I just threw a lot at you there. 
Does anybody have any questions about this? All right, so that's the end of section one. All right, so section two. Let me save as PDF here. So now we're going to talk about computing arithmetic. So we are breaking down all of these different sections based on, uh, we know load stores, we have memory, we have instruction fetch, instruction decode, execution, memory, and write back, correct? So the next stage is, well, we've been talking a lot about um, kind of improving this performance, but what is the computer actually doing? What is the advanced digital system actually accomplishing, right? That's why you're here, that's why you're taking this class other than it's required to get, required to get your degree. So um, Thomas Hobbes, y'all know who Thomas Hobbes is? Y'all thought you didn't have to do philosophy, huh? So uh, Thomas Hobbes is a famous philosopher in the 1600s. Uh, he kind of was talking about subtraction and multiplication as a way of actually, like, so this is kind of the first instance where people were talking about the idea of an arithmetic logic unit. Being able to do something that can do a lot of different math, uh, mathematics uh, in one aspect. Even this is well before computers. This is, you know, slightly after the printing press. But, you know, by, so he's talking about computation. It's either to collect the sum of many things that are added together or to know what remains when a number thing is taken out of another. So he's alluding to multiplication and division here, right? And so what type of uh, a computer is MIPS? Yes, reduced, so the reduced instruction set computer, right? So instead of having a bigger arithmetic logic unit, we have to put in this divider. You can just do a set of subtractions to divide, right? Because that's the whole idea. You're doing 40 divided by 5, where you're just trying to figure out how many times you can subtract 5 from 40 until you run out. So you know, that ends up being eight times. So if you can do eight subtractions faster than you can do a division, then you want to do that in a reduced instruction sets computer. So in, uh, Thomas Hobbes here, uh, he's even he's talking philosophically, but he's referring to the idea of an arithmetic logic unit. So what is going on inside your arithmetic logic unit? So remember we, we talked about this symbolic representation. So we have S1 and S2 are added together and they are put into T1. So what we'll learn about later is S stands for saved registers and T stands for temporary registers. But that's something we don't really need to go into now. So we broke it down into the machine representation here. So this is the op code. So we have 16 plus 1, so that's going to be S1. That's going to be S2. So temporary registers start at 8, so that's this binary is 8, so that's going to be, oh, they made a mistake. It should be T0, but well, even the textbook makes silly mistakes, right? We were talking about all that before. So shift amount 0, and then this function amount corresponds to addition, right? So the, what's the going on here? So the arithmetic logic unit can perform a number of different tasks. So you'd see some sort of control signal coming from the control unit and values coming from the register. So in this case, you have S0 and, I mean, S1 and S2, right? Coming in. And your control unit is coming from here. And I'll describe how that works in a little later in this, in this lecture. So then we do something in the arithmetic logic unit. That's what this whole section is. What's going on inside this box? And then we get registers out, so this is going to be your T1 output that we're going to eventually put back into the registers, and flags. So what we mean by flags is that there are some sort of, there's certain types of overflow flags. Uh, we'll call, we have a specific flag called a zero flag, where it's going to be zero if the values are not identical, and it's one if they are, or uh, it's going to be one if the value on the output is zero. And that we're going to see how you can actually manipulate that to make the program run faster. 
you have some sort of, not only do you have a result, but you have some sort of flags telling you they mean that uh, how you can use that result to improve your performance. So MIPS uses 32-bit numbers. So TGO 2.1, what I want to define here is I want you to know what the maximum and minimum values are of your uh, values here. So what it's, it's two uh, it's two's complement. So and the first number, the first digit in your 32-bit instruction. Let me uh, scroll up. I apologize. Let me scroll up so that way those of you in the can see. So this number here, the first bit refers to the sign. Actually, that's going to be 2.2. The first, most significant bit is used to represent the sign of the number. And then the rest of these just represent the value. So in two's complement, that means you're actually going to be trying to convert a negative number to a positive number. So if you remember, if uh, you had 0, 1, 1, that's 3, right? So how do you convert a 2? Uh, uh, how do you get negative 3 by doing two's complement? Do you all remember? I heard somebody start. Yeah, so basically what you do is you add, add, add you know, you can flip them all so it becomes one, zero, zero. And then in two's complement, what do you do next? In two's complement, what do you do next? There's one other thing you have to do. This, what do you all have done? This is known as one's complement. It's two's complement. Not subtract. Add one. Yeah, so that becomes one zero one. We'll, we'll, I'll show you more examples of that later. Right. So that's why this is all zeros and that's all ones. Right. You see how that's a difference? So it's two thirty one minus one. Right. Because if this was if this was uh, if we had another digit here, this would all be zeros, and that would be two to the thirty-one. So it's two to thirty-one minus one. We flip them all; it becomes two thirty. If we had added one, that becomes two to thirty-one plus one, right? But we didn't, so just it's negative two to the thirty-one, because the most significant digit. Is, that's weird. That keeps doing this. Um, the most significant digit happens to be. One, so that makes the uh, value equal to zero. There we go. Because it's because it's two's complement. Did you all cover you all cover two's complement in two thirty five? One's complement and two's complement. Just two's. Just two's. Okay. All right. In this course, you only need to know two's complement, so don't panic about one's complement. And then two point two. is the most significant bit in MSS. So arithmetic operations are performed using two's complement. So here, this is this is a 32-bit value, but here we can actually kind of just do the same thing using five bits here. So here we have uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. That's 7. So what is 6? 6 would normally be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. You flip them all, it becomes 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. And then you add one, so now it becomes one one zero one zero, which is what we have there. Does that make sense? Flip them all, add one. That's your two's complement. And what we're gonna we're gonna learn later about why we do two's complement that way physically, because what that allows you to do is it allows you to just XOR all of the input bits. And the reason why you have to add one is because if you have some sort of carry bit, it makes everything work out that way. So the two's complement was designed specifically to work physically with arithmetic logic units. So this is just a sample where we add everything up. If you notice, you have, uh, if you actually add these together in the way you do it, you get one zero, one one zero is carries. It's become zero, carries, 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 carries all the way through. And then you add seven and negative six and you get one, right? 
Does that make sense? You look, somebody looks skeptical. Okay. So in this case, what we have here is we've kept, we've got all of these, and then you have a bit that goes over, right? Because if you're adding one and one, you have zero, and then it carries over there. So what would end up happening is one of these flags is we get something known as an overflow flag. So we define overflow as overflow occurs when the result from an operation cannot be represented with the available hardware. So in this case, in this example here, to represent this result, we need a 33rd bit, right? Because we got a carry on the last bit. We can't represent it with the available hardware, which is only 32 bits, so we have an overflow. So then you have an overflow bit flag. In that case, the overflow would go one. It would say we have overflow. And so that way, when you're uh, processing it throughout the rest of the uh, MIPS data path, you actually know that you have overflow. So I had a little thing here uh, about when overflow can and cannot occur. Uh, when you think about this for a split second, it actually makes sense. When adding operands with different signs, overflow cannot occur. Why is that? Yeah, because you actually, you actually, the only way you can not represent it is if it exceeds the value that you have, right? So it's not possible to have a value that can be represented by the architecture, subtract from it, and then have it be larger, right? So same thing, same thing as subtracting two numbers of the same size. The overflow is possible when adding operands of the same size. So if you have 2 to 32 plus 2 to 32, it's going to be exceeded to the side. And subtracting numbers with different times. This is because when the numbers exceed 31 bits, the third value of the 32nd bit becomes overwritten, changing the value of the sign. And so that's here we have we have ones here. Everything's fine. This is two, 1 from 2 to the 31st minus 1. So I have this value here. We subtract them, it goes down, so it's not possible to have overflow in that case. And then the same situation here, you're adding the same sign. What, en what ends up happening is you get all of these uh, carries. Comes over here, carry 110. Then it would go into the sign bit if you don't design it properly. And we remember from the TGO, this is actually... so. 2 to 31 minus 1 plus 1 should not be negative, excuse me, negative 2 to 31, right? So that's why we need overflow bits. So how do we actually regulate this? So the two terms, and uh, I actually, in multiple interviews uh, with Intel and, uh, and MathWorks, which does MATLAB, both of them ask me the same question, differentiate between overflow and exception. So an exception is an unscheduled event that disrupts program flow. So you have something that happens where you can no longer guarantee that the processor is giving you the right answer. You have some sort of overflow, and we're going to learn about in uh, section four about what happens if you have uh, control hazards or data hazards. Any instance where you cannot guarantee that the processor is doing the right thing that's where you need to have these exceptions. You need to stop, stop, slow down. You know, the same thing if some friend who's doing something stupid, you gotta go, oh, oh, oh. you're crossing lines, man. Don't go that way. Same thing, that's what the exception is doing. So add, imme add immediate. Okay, so let me describe the difference between add and add immediate real quick here. Something we'll go into a lot more detail in the next section. So you have, a equals B plus C. So representing this, we can use the values from two registers, correct? Store them in a result and put them into another register. So that's known as an add instruction. An immediate value is what happens if we say A equals B plus 5. You can't just have a reg register for that, right? So reduce instruction second here. But then you have to have a register that represents all 2 to the 32 possible combinations. You have 2 to 32, each one's 32 bits. Suddenly your computer is we're going back to the same size as the room before, right? You can't possibly have that much. So what we do instead 
is the we have an immediate type instruction with the last 16 bits coming from our instruction fetch. Just represent five, and then the rest of these are zero. So if we did a equals b minus five, we just do our two's complement. We flip everything, add one, and then we have our negative five. So then we can just do add, and then have the compiler, since we're a compiler-driven encoding of the micro engine, do two's complement here, so we can reduce the size of the controller, so we don't need an added instruction, add immediate instruction, and a subtraction immediate instruction. And you'll notice this if you go in your textbook and look at the MIP screen sheet at the types of instructions that we have an add immediate, add I, but we do not have a subtract immediate. Does that make sense? <coughs> so, the other thing we need to worry about is in representing numbers is what happens when we have something like scientific notation. We have 1.36 times uh, 10 to the 8, right? Remember that? So we need to do the same thing, but in binary. So we also need to be able to represent positive and negative numbers. So the way this was designed is, if you have uh, eight, we have eight bits, what we're trying to do is we have, break down, we have a sign bit. So the first bit is just the sign. And then we need an exponent and something we call the man system. So in this case, we had 1.38 times 2 to the uh, negative 5. I want to be able to represent both, the, uh, and then 1.38 times 2 to the 5. Well, I want to be able to represent both of these, correct? And I want to be able to do it in the same 32 bits, because remember, reduced instructions that computers are fixed width. I, I, don't, I want to be able to do the same thing. We just make the control a different uh, value in the instruction set. So how do we do this? We need to represent the mantissa and the exponent and our signs. So if I have some value, I need some number of bits to represent the exponent. I need some number of bits to represent the mantissa. And I need some sort of number of bits or bits of the sign. So the sign, we see here in the first one, the first bit is the sign bit, zero for positive, one for negative. In this case, in the IEEE 754 standard, the exponent is eight bits. So what is what is two to the eight? Anyone know? I heard someone mumble it. 256, right? So I can use those eight bits to represent a total of 256 exponents, right? So I want to have positive and negative values, right? So I have some sort of, and as well as two to the zero, right? Because two to the zero is one. So then now we're down to 255, and I want to have some sort of number over here and some sort of number on the opposite side. 255 is an odd number, so we're going to have 128 and 1.7, right? So then we have 200, 128 positive, 127 negative. So basically what we have derived here is that in order to represent negative exponent, we want to have some, we want to be able to take the value that's in the exponent and subtract 127. So if it's zero, it becomes 0 minus 127, and that becomes our exponent value, right? So it becomes, if we have 255, meaning it's all ones, we subtract 127, and our exponent is positive 128, correct? So that is how we came up with E minus 127. I say we as though I was on the committee for this. How uh, they did. So that means we have a sign bit. And we have an exponent bit. So then the next eight bits are the, I'm sorry, the next 23 bits are the mantissa. So that means we somehow represent this value. So what we do is we shift the exponent to the point where the first bit of the mantissa 
it's going to be one point something here, right? This value is the man system. So if it's all zeros, it's going to be 1.0 times by whatever your exponent is, right? So that's why the equation has says here 1 plus the man system. So if I gave you something like this, let me go to the screen so you can all see it on your review. So we'll go over a couple of problems here in a second. So if I had 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 0, 1, 0, and then the rest of these are 0. So how do we actually figure out what this number means? So here, this is just 1, so this is e minus 127. So that becomes negative 126, right? We have our sine bit is 1, so therefore we're going to have negative 1. And then 1, 0, 1, 0. This, this is a decimal point. So this is 2 to the negative 1, right? Plus 2 to the negative 3. So that becomes 0 0.5 plus 0 0.125. So that becomes 0 0.625. And then taking that and putting this into our equation, it becomes 1.0625 times negative 1 times 2 to the negative 126, right? So that's how you use those bits to actually do floating point arithmetic. All right, so the example question here, we're going to be going over this IEEE 754 again. How do we represent the numbers in an advanced digital system? So here we have... A and B, we have negative 1, we have all 1s here and all zeros. So without looking at the solutions, what is, what is, what is part A? What is number A? Letter A. I just made A's numbers. So it's negative what? Why, so okay, so you read the answer before I covered it up. Why would I define it as negative infinity other than 2.6 it says it up here? Right? So, right, because we want, we want to have some sort of value to indicate our maximum and minimum values, right? To prevent overflow. Exactly right. So here we have 2.6 saying it's negative infinity. So what the actual value here is, is negative 1 times... 1 plus 0, 0, 0.0 times 2 to the 255 minus 127, which is equal to negative 2 uh, to the one, uh, 128, right? And so we have defined that in the system as negative infinity. So for part B, we have 0, so that means it's a positive number. So what is this value? So you have 128 plus 5, right? So that becomes 133. Then it's 2 to the 133 minus 127, which is now 2 to the 6. And our mantis is uh, 0, 1, 0, 1. On an exam, I will never uh, put any number past these first four bits. You can do it past the first four bits you've demonstrated knowledge. Anything more is just uh, superfluous and taking you away from other problems. So in this case, 0, 1, 0, 1. So this is going to be 1 point, and then we add that up. So what is 0, 1, 0, 1? What is that in binary? Uh, to convert from binary to decimal, what is that actual value? Someone give a crack at it. 0. 0, 1, 0, 1, base 2 is what in base 10? <clears throat> if I were to convert 0, 1, 0, 1, base 2, what is that number? 5. So how did you all do that? 1 plus 4. So how did you get 1 plus 4? What did... 
Okay, so one column is actually, one is actually two to the zero, right? And four is two to the two. So in this, so now we do the same thing here. It's 0 0.0101. So let's do the same thing with the exponents. This is two to the negative one times zero plus two to the negative two times one. So what's two to the negative two? One fourth, which is 0.25. There we go. Now you guys are cooking with gas. Same thing. 2 to the negative 3 times 0, and this is 2 to the negative 4 times 1. So what is 2 to the negative 4? 0 0.0625. So that becomes, you add them together, and that's going to be 0 0.3125, which you see there. So this becomes 1.3125, because our equation is 1 plus, times 2 to the 6, and you put... Now, on an exam, that is sufficient for full credit. I am not testing you on your ability to put numbers into a calculator. I will only ask you the things that, I, that you need to know in order to demonstrate that you know what an advanced digital system is. So you get to this point, and, and in fact, I typically don't allow calculators on exams. Anything you can do, uh, that's another reason why I don't go over this, because you can do 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, 0 0.0625. If you know those two, those four, you're in good shape. I, when I was taking this class back in my day, um, my professor had a one here and a one there, and it was brutal. Oh, uh, and it was just, it was a subtraction. It was just like, what are you doing? All right. So, does anybody have any questions about that before I move on? So, um, yeah, we, we'll go really briefly into addition, and then uh, we'll wrap up here. So addition. So you all recall from uh, 235, 2.7 is drawing out your one-bit full adder circuit. So one-bit full adder circuit, you want to be able to use an XOR and AND, you A, XOR, B, XOR, C, is going to be the sum value, right? And then your carry value is going to be you have A X or B and C, and then you have A and B or A X or B X or C, right? So this is the circuit layout, and then the end for 2.7 is these equations. So what we want to be able to do in order to go from LSI, small scale integration, this is a medium scale integration circuit, and you want to eventually build up to a very large scale integrated circuit, that's your advanced tool system. So now you've designed them in blocks. In the second portion of this course, when you start doing the keying stuff, you're going to be learning about Verilog and VHDL, which were actually you actually write code to represent the hardware. You would write a, a structure here to describe the adder, and then you would just call the adder again. So we have to constantly call the AND gates and R gates over and over again. And then let the tool do that for you. So the reason why this is important is because we want to understand how two's complement works and why we ultimately did it this way. So in order to physically implement two's complement, you invert all the values in B. So in this case, you recall B is your input here, your second input. So it would be A minus B. So you want to invert all of the values of B first. And that gives you a function of A plus the inversion of B. So if I, what uh, logic gate could I use to always invert a value? So I have a value B here, and I need to get B bar on the output. Okay, so that's the not gate, but let's say I want to control it. I want to say if a value is zero, I just pass B here, but if it's one, I want to get B bar. So the way I just raised the question, you're correct, but how would I actually do this? It would be B in input B bar, so the logic should be uh, zero, 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 
uh, one zero uh, zero one 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 zero zero uh, one zero one 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 zero. Do you recognize that combination of input and output? What is that logic structure? Exclusive OR gate. Very good. So if I have B and I put a one on the input of an XOR gate, I will always get B bar. So I would have some sort of control signal that would tell me. So I'd have control in there, and there would be B XOR control would determine whether or not you're adding or subtracting. So the first thing first is you are doing A plus B bar, and then to obtain two's complement, we're going to add one. So we have some sort of carry in. So we'd have C in, and that would be the carry in. As, but here's the thing. It's also one as the inversion. And if we're doing zero, then we're not actually going to invert as well. So therefore, by using the initial carry as a one instead of a zero, you get A plus B bar plus one, which is equal to A minus B. And so then... This portion here describes what we just uh, derived. Add sub is zero. No B inputs are changed if add sub is equal to one, or add sub is the control signal. And then you can also use add sub as this initial, this initial carry bit as well. And then the next topic we'll add objectives got to be the physical layout. And we'll go over the physical layout, and that's where we'll conclude lecture. And uh, that is, oh, it actually comes out better on the screen than it comes out here. All right, so here we have this add sub value, right, as our input. And we say if it's 0, we want it to be add. If it's 1, it's going to be subtract. So we have all the A values, and this is full adder here, right? That's what this means. So then you have your block. So now you've designed your block. You don't have to worry about it anymore. So all the A inputs are going in fine. So B, if it's... If add sub is zero, it just goes here, and our carry in is zero, right? If this is one, then not only do we invert the value at each XOR gate, so we have B bar, B bar, B bar, and B bar, but by actually splitting it and having it as the carry in, then we add one to obtain our two's complement. Does that make sense? So that is why two's complement is done the way that it is, to reduce the amount of input control signals and reduce the overall size of an add or subtract or logic structure. So on that note, uh, it's going to be uh, TGO is at 1.13 was where we started, right? Because went through 2.9 and then the uh, previous example was what? 2.1. One point thirteen through two point nine, example. Oh no, and then uh, what? Are all the other examples from what? I'll I'll figure it out. So it's two point one. So the question that uh, I got, I hand these back at the beginning of every lecture, so you will have them all available to study on an exam. So I think I got that question two or three times. So I hand these back every day, and that's ultimately how I'll learn all your names. Is I'll be handing these back every day, and so if I'm someone I'll know who you are, and folks just. Yeah, you. Yes. I do not. As as long as it's something I can read. It's, don't don't use a highlighter because all you're doing is telling me that you think certain parts of the paper are more important. Uh, does anybody have? Up, does anybody have any questions about either how the homework po policy or uh, what we cover today? Like everyone said, just.